Okay, I'm here with Rob Johnson, who is a, an economist, a former uh, chief economist at the um, that was at the Senate uh, Banking Committee, right? That's that's true. William Brockmire. <laughs> right. And uh, now is the director of something called the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And uh, we're going to get to what that is in just a moment. But first, I wanted to ask you, uh, in the past few weeks, uh, we've had uh, several actions on Capitol Hill regarding financial reform, uh, movement toward the creation of a consumer uh, financial protection agency, as well as uh, introduction of some legislation dealing with so-called too big to fail banks. Uh, tell me what. Uh, tell me the good and the bad of what's happened uh, with that. As they say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the initiative that the administration's supporting by Elizabeth Warren, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, would go in the category of good. I think it's a useful dimension. Uh, so not unlike the Food and Drug Administration or whatever, and making sure that financial products mean what they say, say what they mean. And uh, I guess, how we say, on the bad side of that, it appears that the lobbyists have made some inroads into diluting the effectiveness or the scope of that particular initiative. Right. On the too big to fail, uh, the good is that I think that they're... Uh, acknowledging that it's a problem and society is certainly seemingly traumatized by the idea that the big and the powerful get bailed out get big bonuses but they are not responsible either to the people or to the market disciplines uh, where I think this is bad is that they're talking about naming the too big to fail in secret putting them on uh, so-called probation in secret and that smacks of insider cronyism between and the uh, banks in question. And, and what, what can you say? I mean, we went through that drill last year. Mm -hmm. It's quite painful. So I would say that the structure of the legislation is a little too bank and a little too crony friendly. And I'd like to see it be more transparent out in the open. Bill Black, the uh, famous SNL investigator regulator, said that uh, it reminds him of Animal House regulation, where you're on double secret promotion. Oh, excuse me, double secret probation. Yeah. And, uh, apparently, that's what uh, Dean Wormer put the uh, guys in the Animal House on double secret probation because they were already on probation. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was something I read this morning um, uh, out of London. Uh, where the uh, government there has actually broke, it's actually breaking up several large banks like the Royal Bank of Scotland and a couple of other institutions. And the question is, uh, if it's good for London, why isn't it good for here? Well, it is good for London, and it probably would be good for here. But getting from here to there means we got to put the people's energy together and get up and over uh, what Dick Durbin says is the group that owns the place. Dick Durbin, you remember on the uh, yeah exactly reform legislation said the banks did about three times the money anybody else did, and uh, and so that uh, I would say that was a dimension. Final thing, which I think is kind of the fault line. I, I testified before Barney Frank's committee on October seventh, and OTC derivatives they call over the counter derivatives. Yeah, this is where the complexity, the opacity and the excessive profit margins for Wall Street exists. Mm -hmm. And the, the rough schematic for that game is they get all this complexity, keeping people, buyers and sellers in the dark, so they make more profits. But when the system freezes up, complex will take, prove that they're solvent. Everybody gets scared, and we go into a tailspin like we did last September, October. So I think we're in a situation where we can't tolerate the unregulated, opaque nature of over-the-counter derivatives. And the House Ag Committee and Financial Services Committee have not, what you might call, uh, addressed those concerns structurally. Right, right. So how do we, what are the pressure, what are the pressure points that we need to be most con concerned about? Help us sort of prioritize what uh, activists uh, need to be focusing on right now. Well, I'd say there are several things. First of all, don't defer to expertise. What Matt Taibbi calls the eye roll, when you start talking about these things, officials roll their eyes like you don't understand and they do. 
officials and experts don't have a very good track record in protecting the public. They don't have a very good track record in predicting the crisis or preventing the crisis. And they don't have a very good track record in cleaning up the crisis. So how would I say, don't defer to experts, know things are wrong, and press till you're satisfied that they're right. Second dimension, I would say the Democratic Party is as much a problem as the Republican Party in this realm. Money in politics is too high. You need comprehensive, what you might call public financing of elections. You do need, short of that, to start looking at the swing races in the House, the contested races, and putting pressure on Democrats, or for that matter Republicans, but primarily Democrats, to hold the line for the public and resist what I, I guess I would say is I'd like to make voters mobilize so they make people afraid to take Wall Street's money. The money's well, you, there, but they well, can't you, take it. Well, it's an interesting point because I, as I'm reading this morning, um, you have people like uh, White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel uh, essentially encouraging uh, members of Congress to weaken uh, things like Sarbanes-Oxley, the bill that was, the legislation that was imposed after the Enron disaster to bring more account of corporate accountability and more honest accounting. Now, how do you, when you've got that kind of stuff coming from a Democratic White House, you know, that's that's pretty formidable stuff when you've got you know, the White House encouraged basically uh, swim, swimming uh, along with what, what the banks and the financial institutions want. Well, I, I would encourage people to fortify themselves along the lines you just described by reading Lance Selfa, new book called Democrats, a Critical Appraisal, or Paul Street's work on Barack Obama that's on the Z website, or uh, Tom Ferguson's stuff on the golden rule, he who has the gold rules. These are predictable behaviors from the what you might call Democratic Leadership Council, the DLC type Democrats, of which Rahm Emanuel is one. And until we can diminish the role of money in politics, we're not going to have policies, whether it be health care or energy or finance, that really take good care of the body politic. Money counts too much, voters count too little. And we've got to change that equation. Let me ask you then about what you're doing right now with this new Institute for New Economic Thought. Uh, it's being supported with uh, $50 million from George Soros uh, over a 10-year period. Uh, what will you be doing with that money? Well, first of all, we have a group of about 22, 23 uh, economists from around the world. We're going to embark upon making research grants, holding conferences, uh, setting up institutes at various universities, like in conjunction with the campus around the world, and try to catalyze a, what you might call a reopening of the debate. What Soros has characterized as free market fundamentalism, uh, hostility towards government, or, I mean, even alternatively, some people are naively romantic about the possibilities of government. But this group is going to come together and try to open up the paradigm, open up the conversation, nourish financially with incentives, with colleagues and with community, young scholars who want to take a different path than you might say the path that the uh, free market fundamentalists, the efficient market hypothesis and others have embarked upon in, in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. that I think led us to that point. When I manage, mentioned experts earlier, yeah, experts do not prescribe things to prevent a crisis when they do not diagnose or anticipate a crisis and they do not explain it and they do not repair it, they lose the right to be experts. Economists want to portray themselves as experts, people who should be listened to, people who should have influence. They have to earn that. And I think this group is saying after this crisis, we have to regroup and re-earn the confidence of people in the potential uh, of expertise to help make the world a better place. Well, I wish you a lot of luck in, in, in doing that. It's going to be a very difficult struggle given uh, where the political winds are right now. Yes, I think it's a difficult struggle, but that's sort of what defines an interesting challenge. Too. So. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.